Thank you, Michael. And he has. Oh, and good morning. It's good to be with you here in, in Beijing. 50 years ago, uh, which is a long time to many of you, uh, I was a junior in college uh, getting ready to launch a campaign uh, for the presidency of the student body of the school that I was in. And I was working on different planks of my political platform and heard about this conference on something that I had never heard of. It was called Education Reform. In this case, how a student might change for the better the university that they were in. Uh, the idea that, that education was something that you might actually change uh, as opposed to something that was done to you was a complete and, and kind of novel idea, idea to me. And off I went to a conference out on the plains of, of Kansas in 1968 with hundreds of students that were talking about this particular topic. That conference really changed my life, and I was smitten with the idea that schools could and should be uh, better, and that they could and should be changed. Uh, the next year, uh, I actually ran that political campaign uh, while everyone else was protesting the Vietnam War. Um, my little bumper sticker said, for a better education, and, um, and we won handily, and then I learned what all school reformers learn, that changing schools is a lot more complicated uh, than it looks. And 50 years later, uh, I'm still trying. Uh, I, I like to joke that school reformers think that the myth of Sisyphus uh, is a vacation. Uh, it's been a, a long uh, journey with victories and with progress, but also with setbacks and false starts and, and false summits. And um, the good news is I think uh, our long wait as reformers uh, is almost over and that the world is actually on the cusp of seeing a wave of the first modern schools uh, of our era. Uh, these do not exist yet. Uh, I don't believe there are any out there, uh, but the outlines of them are increasingly clear and primarily because of the great work that has been done by reformers that have gone before us uh, across the world and across uh, the decades. There are glimmers, uh, if you will, uh, examples of, of innovation all around the, the globe, but someday soon, teams of reformers uh, around the world are gonna pull those together into new whole school models, um, and the world's gonna say when they see these, why did it take so long? There, there will be many of them, uh, just like in other sectors, uh, there'll be everything from Mercedes to Fiat and Alibaba to, to Amazon, and that's a good thing because competition raises all boats. What I'd like to do this morning is just to outline uh, how those new wave of schools are going to be different from the schools that we all want, went to. I like to say we all went uh, to the same school because worldwide schools are more alike uh, than they are different. So what I'd like to do is just in 30 seconds to take you through quickly these points and then I'll come back and uh, cover each with a little more um, uh, detail. The modern school is going to be global yet connected to its community. It's going to be focused more on individuals than on groups of students. It's going to be a one-stop shop where all of the particular needs of parents and students are found in one place. It's not going to require a vow of poverty by faculty uh, to teach there. It's going to use uh, technology, but it's going to understand that technology uh, does not really care uh, about children. Uh, it's going to be architecturally um, more modern than a prison, uh, and it's going to be a system of schools as opposed to today, really the last great cottage industries. And then finally, uh, it's not going to be about profit, but it's going to use profit and the mechanisms of the capital market uh, to realize its ambitions. 
What I'd like to do is just walk you through each of those uh, quickly. Uh, number one, uh, the first modern school is going to escape its local and national boundaries and, and really from its inception is going to be defined as a global institution. Old schools were really instruments of their locales or of their nations. Modern schools will understand that graduates must see our planet as it is, as one home for us all, inextricably interconnected. Modern schools are going to embrace what one Chinese teacher uh, taught me, that a second language is actually a second soul, and that only through language can we truly uh, understand other cultures, uh, and that we cannot really be bicultural unless we're bilingual. Modern schools are going to recognize that monoglots, single language, people like me and like so many Americans, uh, are no longer competitive uh, and nor fully compassionate. And they're going to grasp that counting on English uh, being spoken by everyone everywhere is really an imperialistic notion. Uh, advanced fluency in a second and third language are going to be non-negotiable requirements of, of modern schools and intense uh, long-term immersion programs uh, will be a must. Being global is not necessarily politically correct uh, these days. In America, it's called America First. Uh, in France, it's uh, Le Pen supporters yell, it is our land with the emphasis on our. Uh, but in my view, there's no retreat into our national shells. Uh, air pollution does not go through customs and immigration. Uh, the melting ice shelves of Antarctica are going to continue to cause flooding uh, in Miami. Uh, the economic and other refugees of Syria and Africa and Mexico are going to keep coming. Uh, and companies are always going uh, to look uh, for where they can be the most competitive. Uh, we're one planet uh, and there's no going back and, and modern schools uh, will really embrace that concept. Two, the, um, the modern school educates individual students and not groups of students. I have two daughters and one of my daughters, Sasha, came home uh, last year from Middlebury College in, in Vermont to interview my wife and I on a film that she was doing uh, for her senior thesis. And the film she was doing was about academic failure. It was her, the title of the film was actually the F word. Um, Sasha, she scored a perfect 800 on her math SAT and was captain of her, her college track team. You can see uh, I'm a proud dad and she's a talented and smart girl. But 10 years ago, she was almost counseled out, which is a euphemism used in elite New York City private schools to ask students to leave uh, when they're not performing particularly well academically. Uh, she was mildly dyslexic since she had difficulty with reading and she struggled for years and remembers the pain uh, of that time quite vividly and actually this is what her film and thesis were about. Um, our children, just like all of us, are bundles of strengths and weaknesses. They learn at different paces, uh, they like different things, uh, they go in different directions. And yet our schools, and even our best ones, march our children along in kind of an academic batan death march of one size fits all, and stragglers are left behind to salvage their self-esteem as best they can. Mo modern schools will know there are many ways for children to succeed, to be happy, and to prosper. Modern schools will help every child in the school find their one best thing. That's something that they care about, that they can do well. And around and through that one best thing, modern schools will teach them so much else. The 1500 meter uh, can teach you a lot of mathematics. Editing a film can lead you to understanding how to edit words. But the most important lesson 
um, that one receives from doing something really well is the confidence that comes out of that. It splashes over uh, into the rest of your learning and your life uh, in a major way. It is earned confidence, and that is the, that's something that is a power that never goes away. This is going to be the greatest gift that modern schools will give their children, and the first modern schools are going to do this uh, in a way that we don't see today. Three, many believe that the personalization of schooling, noted in the earlier point, is going to be achieved by the widespread introduction of technology. And in fact, uh, that's a big part of this conference. And let's go ahead and say it, just like you can take uh, a driver out of a taxi or a pilot out of a plane, the same could be school, true in schools. You could take teachers out of the classroom as well. That is not a vision uh, that I share, and I reject it not out of some sentimentality, but because I don't think that computers and technology uh, are soon to achieve something that's critical in, in a great school, which is empathy with students. Tech can set teachers free for certain tasks, but computers do not care about children as our best teachers uh, do. And in the first modern schools, computers will grade, they'll organize, they'll drill, they'll take attendance, They'll assign productive homework. They'll even do lectures. But teachers, and only teachers, can inspire and comfort and coach and discipline. Uh, Silicon Valley will not replace uh, brick and mortar institutions of schooling um, where students will continue to scream their lungs out on the playground. Four, a modern school will be a place you can work without a vow of poverty. Now, some would say that's already true, and uh, the average teacher pay in the United States uh, in 2013 was $56,000 a year, or about 350,000 RMB. A two-teacher household in the United States has an income of about 110,000 a year, or about 700,000 RMB, which by most definitions would put a two-teacher household squarely uh, in the middle class. What is also true is that it is very difficult in teaching to rise beyond that particular reward level. And there's no middle management of, of money in, in schools, and often there's a practice that heads of schools, at least in public schools, are not paid that differently uh, than the senior faculty uh, of those same sites. And simply, stated teaching is not an economically rewarding career and our brightest are not being attracted to it, uh, particularly in the West. Uh, the average math SAT of, of students going into teaching was 479. The average verbal SAT was 485. Uh, those are embarrassingly low scores uh, for those that are gonna be teaching our youth. The solution is not that we go double teacher salaries. That's not viable uh, economically, probably in, in any society. But one solution could, could be that we have much better career paths uh, for teachers so that they can have steps and find their way to meaningful compensation. For instance, if you said, one out of every 10 teachers is gonna be a lead teacher and they will be paid double what a lead, what a typical teacher would be, that's a step. If you then really make differences between division heads and school heads, uh, that can, can be a path to wealth generation for those that choose education. And another way to say it, there needs to be a path of making partner and real ownership in the world of education, just as there is uh, at McKinsey or elsewhere. Uh, one interesting thing, and a side point actually, is that teacher comp and respect uh, of teachers are two different things, and research actually shows it. Uh, the country where teachers are most admired in the world, you guessed it, is, is the one that we're all sitting in today, China. Uh, Lao Xi is, is a form of cultural reverence here, and though China is not at the top uh, of the scale in terms of teacher pay, it has somehow found a way 
for teachers to have great respect uh, in this society, and it's something that uh, we should study worldwide. Five, uh, the modern school uh, is going to be different architecturally. It's going to be more like WeWorks uh, than what, what we see schools today. If you look at the world of old offices with um, offices around the perimeter, uh, doors, closed walls, uh, etc., and you compare that to any modern day firm in Shenzhen or Silicon Valley where they're light filled offices with everyone working on the floor together, uh, that's what you're going to see in typical school design uh, in the future. Uh, like isolated offices, uh, classrooms are going to change a great deal. It doesn't mean there won't be classrooms, uh, but you won't spend your whole day uh, in them as many of us did when we were in school. Uh, Renzo Piano, one of the great uh, architects of the world, says schools should be more like great workshops, uh, and I think they will be. Six, in the old world of schooling, our best schools were single campus institutions. Um, here in Beijing, Renda Fujian, Nanjing Foreign Language, Exeter, Eaton, Harrow, Shanghai High, Thomas Jefferson. Uh, these are all great individual schools uh, across the world. In the, in the new world of modern schooling, our best schools are actually going to be part of systems, highly integrated global systems. And like every other sector of life that we know, scale is going to be important in the world of schooling. It provides the ability to conduct research and development, to perfect systems, to build protocols, and to offer real growth uh, and reward for team members. Uh, some are going to miss the, um, the kind of charm of the old corner uh, school, but those same individuals are going to be attracted to the quality and the reliability of this next generation. Uh, of schools. Seven students' uh, studies have been done that show that old schools utilize their physical plants about 25% of the time, with those buildings sitting empty most weekends, most of the summer, uh, and most evenings. Uh, your children, uh, on average, are awake about 6,000 hours a year. They go to school only 1,200. Uh, hours a year are about 20% uh, of their time. Meanwhile, school customers, that would be parents, are running all over the cities that they're in to provide in that other 80% of children's time music lessons, sports offerings, tutoring, test prep, doctor and dental appointments, entertainment options, etc. A big part of modern day parenting is just being able to drive. The modern the modern day school is going to integrate all of the educational offerings that parents and students require under one roof, and that's going to do two things. It's going to provide much greater convenience uh, to parents, but even more important, it's going to integrate the supplementary educational offerings with the core curriculum programs of the school, and a good bit of personalization will actually come from that integration between uh, the two. And then eight and last, most, not all, but most modern schools will be for-profit institutions. I personally hate that word, for-profit. I think it was actually created by the enemies uh, of for-profits because it implies that the only objective of a business uh, is to make profit. And in fact, it's, it's not true. The objective of most great businesses is first to do something useful and valuable uh, to customers and then to be rewarded for it uh, in, the term, in terms of profit. So I'd like to officially change that name instead of for-profit to by-profit, meaning modern schools will use capital and profit, but they do it as a means uh, to achieve what they're really trying to do which is build a great school. And most, though no, not all, will be by profit institutions. You might ask, well, why is that the case? And if you, if you, particularly if you look at the West, uh, philanthropy has been 
a major driver uh, in the great schools of the West. Uh, but that is not going to scale, and if you look at these numbers, you will see why. Uh, in the United States, we spend about $600 billion a year on K-12 education. Roughly $3 billion per school day is our national investment um, in public education. If you take the total philanthropy into K-12 education in the United States, the, the largest estimates are about $3 billion a year. All of the philanthropy in K-12 would run our schools, the 100,000 public schools in the U.S. for one day. Um, and what that means is that if, if we're going to have scalable innovation, it's gonna come from one of two sources, either from government funding or from sustainable by profit uh, institutions. And we all know that even in the most well-meaning government policies, innovation is tough, and so I happen to think that a great deal of innovation will come from the by-profit sector. So there you have it. Um, those are the key elements of, of what I think this next era of schooling is going to look like. Uh, I've got a few years left in my 50-year journey uh, to see uh, the first modern school, uh, and I'm optimistic that I will and that everyone here in the room will as well. And indeed, I think many uh, in this room are going to be important uh, architects of that future. Best of luck to you. Thank you, Michael, for um, having this conference and, and inviting me as well. Thank you.